So, hello, Marcus. We are recording. Hello, John. Thank you for agreeing to this interview. Uh, just for anybody listening, uh, do I have your permission to post this on YouTube and show people that we had a great, fantastic interview? Yeah, let's hope we do. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we can only hope. You know, we can only hope. I did my homework, so I'm ready. Oh, good. You got some Announce. questions. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're going to do the introduction, but I wanted to be able to follow along. So I did some, read some Ellen Brown essays. Uh, I actually got to interview her a couple of years ago, but I've, I've been out of the topic regarding public banking. We just had it happen here in California, but most people don't understand it well. So I know you're an expert on the subject, and I was hoping we could have a discussion about what is public banking? What does that allow you to do? Why is it a good idea? Um, a lot of Californians don't have the basics. Right. So the way that I would start out is by um, letting us consider a, a, an interesting question. Um, okay. If you need money to live and, you know, your whole life uh, is, it, your life isn't oriented towards money, your life is supported by money. So if you have money, you've got way more power than if you haven't got money or if you have a lot of money or you have a little money. So what I'm saying is that money is really important. It's kind right. of, it's kind of like, um, it's what orients your life. Okay. I need to do whatever it is I need to do in order to have the money to live. Right. Right. Yeah. And I don't like money. I mean, that's a, that's a piece of the, of the thing. Um, but I do understand that society is using money as its main organizing principle. So right. whatever I can get money for, I can do. And what I can't get money for, I can't do. Unless I can do it as a hobby voluntarily. Right. Okay. I just make sure that, that, that that's clear. Right. So the question is, why don't we know who's issuing the money? If it's that important and everything <laughs> depends and everything depends on you know how we get money yeah uh, and, and what we have to do to have money and and you know we used to be able to save money now we have to invest it and take on a lot of risk cuz interest rates are so low it goes on and on and on you know why 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 wouldn't we know wouldn't all of us know who's issuing the money? Okay. That, that is the question. Who's because, issuing the money? Yeah, who's issuing the money? Okay, so there are lots of, I mean, you can go to YouTube and uh, put that in, who's issuing the money interviews, and listen to the people who've gone out in the street and ask people what they know about who issues the money. And they say all kinds of things, and they're always wrong. And they say the federal government issues the money, or they say the Fed issued, the Federal Reserve Banks issue the money, or they say, uh, well, we have a fractional reserve monetary system. Do you understand how that works? No, I don't. You know, there's supposed to be people who do understand it. So rather than uh, doing something that relies on authorities like economists and bankers and what have you. Um, I'm going to take you through the actual process of your dealings with banks. Now remember, okay. what we're trying to get to is what can a public bank do that a private right. bank can't do, right? That's what we're trying to get to. We want to get to a point. Right where we actually right. understand what the difference is right. because it's, it's crucial to, to understand it. But you have to understand banking first and you have to understand where money comes from first before that's significant, right? I mean, who cares whether it's a public yeah. bank or a, or a Wall Street bank? It's, you know, amounts to the same thing. Okay, maybe a public bank has less interest. Okay, so let's go to the bank because we just got a birthday present in the mail 
or at the party and somebody's given us a hundred dollar bill and uh our thinking is um i think i better deposit the hundred dollar bill they're hard to spend i could lose it you know it'll it's much too easy. let me put it in the bank so you go to the bank and you do what you think of as depositing your money in the bank right that's what you think you're doing so so i'm i'll have a bank you know it'll go into my account at the bank it's my money okay okay so let's actually see what happens you hand the hundred well you fill out a deposit slip and you hand and you don't have to do that anymore by the way it's you know everything gets more and more convenient <laughs> so that you have to think about it much less right, right? it's right. just automatic you know okay so now i can pay with i just bring my phone close to the to the reader and i've paid you know? right <laughs> so there's this convenience piece but anyway that, that lets you not think about it right anyway so you hand the the deposit slip and the hundred dollar bill to the bank and the teller takes the hundred dollar bill and puts it in the cash drawer and puts okay. something in your bank account i mean they're it, they'll put a hundred dollars in your bank account but is it your hundred dollars so if you actually look at what actually happened right there you gave the hundred dollar bill which says on it this bill this note is legal tender for all debts public and private that's what it says on the note so it's right. backed by the full faith and credit of the united states of america the government etc it's a it's a legal tender note lawful money right right okay so you hand it to the to the um bank and the bank puts the the teller puts it in the cash drawer from the cash drawer it goes to the uh into the vault and in from the vault or actually as soon as you hand it to her it goes on to the balance sheet of the bank as an asset in other okay. words it's not your hundred dollar bill anymore it's the bank's hundred dollar bill you cannot tell the bank what to do with that hundred dollar bill now the Got reason it. that you think that it's like that is that you can turn around go to the cash machine and take out a hundred dollar bill or a 20 you know a bunch of 20s so the the, the point that i'm trying to make is that that hundred dollar bill when you deposit do what the bank calls deposit and i'm doing air quotes on purpose because it's not right really, you're doing, right. not really right. depositing it right right it's now the bank so the bank does the only thing that the bank could do it puts in your bank account that it owes you a hundred dollars right you okay. handed them a hundred dollars so now the bank owes you a hundred dollars right okay so the hundred dollar bill is an asset of the bank and the money in your account is when you opened the account you signed a whole bunch of documents you didn't read did you read the agreement no right it says that uh, that that agreement says in a lot of gobbledygook and sort of hidden that you are accepting uh bank credit as money right so they you make a demand loan to the bank when you deposit a hundred dollar bill which is legal tender which says on it this note is legal tender for all debts public and private that's where the whole thing about the government issues the money. Well, yes, the government prints it, but they're not issuing it. Cut for the following reason. The, you made a demand loan to the bank and a demand loan means that the bank has to pay you whenever you demand it. How do you know that it's a demand loan? They pay you a little bit of interest. It used to be you could get 2% right one and a half two maybe three percent on your now account your negotiable in your uh negotiable order of withdrawal right that's what a okay. now account so you used to get a little interest oh well yeah sure i did lend the money to the bank i yes that's right i made a demand loan to the bank 
So when you deposited the $100 bill, you also deposited uh, checks. And so okay. you know that the bank is going to do something with those checks and they don't ever have to take possession. What they're going to do is use the uh, clearing function of the banking system to take the money out of somebody else's account and put it in your account. They're going to follow the instructions on the check. Got it. Now, the banking system, this, this indicates, because it doesn't matter where the bank is. It can be anywhere in the world, actually. They might charge you a fee for, but, you know, we're, usually we have free checking. So there isn't even a fee for the bank to do all of this, right? So the banking system as a whole is one system. It's not like there are separate banks. Oh, yes, there are separate banks. That's our experience. But really, there's one big banking system. Okay. It's all one system. And it's okay. run by the Federal Reserve system. Okay. And there are okay. 12 Federal Reserve banks that are involved District in, Street. right, that are involved in the um, uh, check clearing. Yeah, we have so one in our, San Francisco, I believe. Yeah, right. So our entire economy is based on the banks being able to settle the accounts between us, right, with check clearing, totally and completely reliably. So you, okay. you, when you want to know where your money is, you reconcile to the bank. Why? Because the bank is totally and utterly reliable. In fact, okay. In fact, you don't find the mistake that the bank made. The bank tells you, hey, we made a mistake. Because <laughs> their accounting, yeah. Right? Yeah. Their accounting yeah. system is really, really good. Yeah. I, yes. They are very okay. aware, down to the two penny, <laughs> how much you owe them and what they owe you and where all the cash is at every moment. And yes, it is very reliable. I've, for all my complaints about the banking industry, like, collapsing the American and global economy, they're very, very good at keeping track of all the money and where it goes. Absolutely. And they are, and that, that is a, so, I don't want to slam them. That is a no, that useful is, function for regular people who don't have a machine gun and a bulletproof vest <laughs> to be able to store their money and not yeah. have to worry about it. That's why we do this, right? So it's not old West and it's like, I've got uh, my but, thousands underneath because my grandma was Oki and lived through the depression and, and she told me about when they didn't go to banks what they did which was jars full of money buried in the backyard <laughs> and, and that was because that was the only way that they could handle cash and exchange it and be safe and secure so yeah there absolutely is a vital function being used by banks being able to provide security for your money that you don't physically have to protect right that's why i brought the hundred dollar bill to the bank Yes, because I don't want that in my pocket. <laughs> I don't want it in my pocket. Worried about. I, I want the 20s, right? So I don't have to yeah. go through the hassle of the card and what, and I don't have to account for it. You know, even when I'm doing my accounting, I can, you know, in, in my case, I can spend like $200 a month in cash without bothering to account for it. It's called miscellaneous or whatever. So I don't buy my right. coffee uh, with... Uh, you know, with my credit card or my debit card. I just use cash. And whenever I'm using my debit card, it always gives me the option for cash back. So it's very easy to get cash. I'm at the supermarket. I put my debit card in and I get to choose how much cash back I want. Yeah, I want 20 bucks back so that I don't have to buy cat, uh, coffee or coffee and a donut yeah. or whatever, right? Okay. So, so that's, that's Private banking. For the people listening in later on, we have been talking about private banking, and John Root Jr. has been explaining how private banking works. The bank that you know of, that you go yeah. to the store and deal with most people. Okay, so, deal with, so now, now we're going to go off the deep end. Okay. So you need to, hold, you need to hold on to your seat. <laughs> Got okay, it. There we go. Holding on. What are we real? Okay, so we need the banks and the reliability and the check clearing and settling yeah, the accounts yeah, and doing yes. the, we need all that. And, and that's Very wonderful. Worthwhile. That's wonderful. Okay, when else do you need the bank? 
I think businesses need banking and, and governments need banking. And, and when that is do you different. need the bank? When do Me? you need the bank besides the check clearing? Um, to get a loan. There you go. I mean, isn't the bank amazingly significant when you want something that you haven't been able to save up for? Yes, you, most people have to get a bank loan for their car and their home, which are the top two purchases by volume that any citizen will make. So for most of the things that people put their money into, you go to the bank to get that loan. That's right. Okay, so what happens when you go to the bank to get the loan? And we're going to do this exactly. Okay. We're going to do this exactly so that you can totally understand what happens. Okay, don't break my brain, all right? I'm not going to break your brain. I'm going to take you through it step by step. Okay. So you go to the bank and you sit down with somebody at the bank, you know, usually an assistant branch manager or a loan officer, right? Um, It depends on what it is that you're borrowing. I mean, you can do this online now, and they've totally obviated the need to know their customers beyond their credit score and their social security number. So you can get a loan online. You know, you can apply for a credit card without any big deal. But let's say that you're, you want to know how much you can borrow to buy a house. And that's the first thing. You go to the uh, mortgage broker or you go to the banker and uh, they look at your credit score. They look at your history. They look at where it is that you want to buy a house. You haven't necessarily picked the house yet. And they will tell you, what you're good for. In fact, they could even give you a commitment letter. Mm. So um, we will lend you um, $250,000 as a mortgage to buy a house um, that can cost up to, uh, you know, so that there's a little, there's usually a little um, equity that you have to provide. So you can't borrow the whole amount unless you're a first time buyer and you know, there's programs and guarantees for the bank, etc. So, uh, the bank has given you a commitment letter, right? So you know how big of a house you can go for. So, right. 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 That's a, it's important because, you know, now I'm in a position to go look for how, I mean, I always know what I'm good for because because I'm always up on these things, but most people aren't. So they're very happy to find out what they can handle. No, and it's the same way with cars. When I went to go buy a car, they told, um, I worked with the dealership and they go, we'll go ahead and go through the bank and figure out how much you have to work with. So the bank was already going to tell me, Mark, you only get to spend so much. And then the car dealers literally go, that means these cars here. So much the same way. These banks pre-authorize or say, for your credit, you're only, we're willing to loan this much to you. This is how much risk we're willing to take out with you. Right. Okay. Um, so that, that establishes the role of the bank in our lives and the role of the credit score in our lives. Okay. Okay, Okay. so now you've chosen the house, and uh, you've made the offer. The offer has been accepted, and uh, so now you got to do the closing, right? You actually have to go to, well, sometimes you don't even have to go to the bank anymore, but it used to be and still is to a large extent, that you go to the closer. Now, what happens at the closer? Well, there are the bankers there, and the real estate agents are there, the brokers or the whoever, the lawyer for the bank, the lawyer for you, your lawyer, to make sure that everything happens the way that it it needs to happen. So the first thing that you do is you sign a promissory note that you don't read. Right. Right, you sign a promissory note that you haven't read. The lawyer tells you, either the bank's lawyer or your lawyer, or both, tell you this is standard. This is the usual bank agreement. 
This is what yeah. you have to sign. So why yeah. bother to read it? You don't get to change it. You don't get to question it. And you don't have an option. And you don't have any option. It's not a negotiation. This is what you got to sign. And what, the, what yeah. you do know is the term and the rate. So you know the principal amount, you know the term, and you know the uh, interest rate. And if you're a little bit enterprising, you'll find the amortization schedule, right? So you'll yeah. see that for the first 15 years of a 30-year mortgage, you're paying mostly interest. And after 15 years, it's sort of even for a while. And then right. gradually, you're paying more principal than interest. Okay, so if you look at the amortization schedule, you say to yourself, hmm, I'm buying the bank a house first. Right. I'm paying enough money for the bank over the period of the loan. I'm paying enough money to the bank for them to be able to buy a house. And then I get to pay right. for the house that I'm living in. Right. What did, what did banks do to be able to get that much uh, from me? And, 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 and not only that, you know, if I look at, at history, I'm going to be buying my house with inflated money and I'm going to be paying interest with current value money. I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, go too off the deep end. Um, but yes, I, I absolutely hear you. So we, we have a basic understanding of... We haven't gotten to the deep dive yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Eventually, though, we have to come back around and explain how... I the am. Process... I am. Okay. okay. Exactly oh. what we're doing. It's exactly okay. what right. we're doing. All right. Okay. All right. So you've signed the promissory note and the lawyers hand you the mortgage and you sign the mortgage. In other words, the bank has the title to the house. Um, it's there. It's the bank's house until you've paid it all off, and then they will give you the, uh, the title at the end of the mortgage. Hmm. I'm not living in my house. I'm living in the bank's house, but that's okay yeah. because that's what banks are for. Yes. To give me the money. You're leasing it from them, basically. Okay. So... The banker takes the promissory note and leaves the room. Takes the promissory note and the, and the mortgage, and he leaves the room, and he comes back with checks. So he comes back with a check for the lawyers. He comes back with a check for the brokers, for the real estate people, for the title company. That, that assures that the title is good and there aren't going to be any problems, right? And he puts in your mortgage account the amount of the principal and it comes out of that account to the seller. Okay. Okay. Where did the bank get the money to do that? It, well... It took the money that was given to it by people who deposit cash in the bank. Oh, so, so the bank tells you that you can't have your money because they've lent it to someone else? Is that what happens? You get a letter from the bank, we lent your deposit to somebody? No, no. So It doesn't I think happen, hitting, does it? No, what you're hitting okay. at, I think, is called fractional so, reserve banking. Well, hang on a second. Okay. There ain't no such thing. <laughs> it's the fractional the whole idea of fractional reserve banking is an illusion it's a sort of a way of making what they do reasonable but what, yeah. what we're getting at is that when you sign the promissory note and the mortgage and it's the promissory note that's the, the 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 mortgage is backing up the promissory note it's no nowhere near as significant except in your life um, as the promissory you are promising that you will do all the things necessary to have the money to make the monthly payment to the bank. Yeah. That promissory note is very valuable. 
it's more valuable than what they're lending you because it includes all that interest. Oh. And you know, and you know that banks sell them. Right. Can you sell something that isn't yours? The banks can. No, it's theirs. You oh. gave them a promise to pay. That right. promise to pay is an asset of the bank. The bank owns it exactly like it owns that $100 bill. Okay. No different. What did it put in your bank account that you paid the seller with? The same thing. Now look, this, this is the deep dive. This is that moment where your whole worldview changes, they put in your bank account what they owe you. They put their liability. You gave them the, an asset, your promise to pay, bank's asset, your liability, <clears throat> their liability, your asset. They put their liability in the bank account and it's their liability and your asset. Okay. That's, how, that's how accounting works always. There's always assets and liabilities and they always work out, including, you know, okay, could the bank have lent you money that they had saved and it was part of their retained earnings and capital of the bank? Yes, but I, I don't think they've done that for, what, 80, 90 years? No, they've never done it. They have always lent you what they owe you. Okay. Now I went through this carefully enough so that the, the, uh, you know, the weight of banks issue the money, right, should be clear. The bank okay. created the money that they lend you, quote unquote lend you, but as credit as their liability, what they owe you. So you and the bank both came to the table at the closing with no money. You came to the table with no money, so you promised to pay. The bank came with no money, so they monetized your promise to pay. That is, uh -huh. amazingly, that is an amazingly special privilege. Banks get to monetize your word. Huh. Banks get to create the money that you agree to pay them. Okay. That's law, right? That's, that's the Federal Reserve Act. That's private banking law. That's what all the regulation's about. Okay. Okay, so here comes the consequence. You can only get money for what will be profitable to a bank. Okay. All of the money in circulation in America and in the world is issued by banks as a debt to themselves, their liability, what they owe you. Okay. Can you imagine giving a private company the power to issue money only for things that will be profitable to them when we are completely dependent on getting money in order to live? It would oh. mean that they would control everything of real importance <laughs> and be the lever keepers on what so, the public so we, was able to invest in. Okay, so now let's, let's relieve the pressure. Hey, should we have a public bank? I, I think shall so. We have a, shall we have a bank that, that isn't only lending money or only creating money for purposes that will be profitable to it? Yeah, yes. I, I believe it, it, it's a good idea uh, for the little bit of, I've heard about the North Dakota okay. Bank, which is the enabling so, legislation i think you said here in california is based upon that uh, i looked at the bill and it even it heavily references right the north dakota bank yeah and the and the point about the bill it's it's interesting how the process you were you said earlier in the pre in, in the pre-interview um that uh you know 
it was amazing how everybody caved. You know, the, the, you know, the legislature passed it, the governor signed it. All of a sudden, there's, you know, it just happens. Why? Because they haven't yes. created a public bank. They've cleared the hurdle so that nobody can argue that it's illegal for a county or a city or a uh, university, any public entity in California to start a public bank. Now they actually have to do it. Fair enough. Yeah, so Fair nobody enough, has actually chartered a public bank yet. So there is no but public there's bank no in obstacle. California. Yeah. No public bank in California yet. But in 2020, I mean, San Francisco and Los Angeles and Berkeley and uh, I can't remember. I can't keep all this in my head. I mean, there are lots of cities that are, are working on the <clears throat> bill that would establish the public bank. Okay, so now I want, what I want to do, um, once you understand that our entire culture, our entire society, our entire economy is totally all based on what you can get money for that will be profitable to a bank. Right. Okay, so now we can think, well, if we weren't interested in making a profit for even for our public bank, right? And we were talking together about what would be a good thing to issue money for that we could be responsible for. I mean, the, there's nothing wrong with what the bank is doing, right? Monetizing our credit is, you know, the way to create money. There is no, no, uh, there's no argument there. You can't issue money except as a receipt for a, for a genuine good or service. It has to be, it can't be backed by gold and silver. There is nowhere near enough gold and silver. Right. And in fact, if you back it with gold or silver, the legal tender value of the money has to be much higher than its value as gold or silver. So it's still a matter of law. It's still something that, that has to be created as a social technology, like rights. What are rights? Rights, rights, rights. Um, governments are instituted to secure our inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if we were sitting together, this is, I want to get at why public banking is so important beyond uh, it would cost us less interest. Okay. Okay, let's, let's go back to banking for a bit. I can, tell, tell me what you're thinking, because it helps to know a little bit about where you're at and what you're thinking and how, how this is affecting you. Well, from the, the research that I have done, which was largely based upon um, Ellen Brown's reading and the North Dakota public bank. It appears that the public bank is, like you said, its goal is to serve the public. It's not to necessarily make a profit for people who own the bank. Uh, people forget that there are rich people, one percenters who own each bank, and it's their concern to make money off that bank. It's basically a business. Whereas the public bank is more like a, a, a public infrastructure it, it provides for things its goal is not to just make as much profit as possible and so instead of earning interest on the money that's deposited in the public bank that interest can be turned back to the government uh, for infrastructure projects or lowering initial taxes as i understand which is something a private bank would never do Right, but that's just sort of the superficial argument. The superficial argument is it'll cost us less and we'll have more. The interest won't be going to Wall Street, it'll be coming back to us. Yes. So if you look at what the Bank, what the, um, bank of North Dakota does, it returns about 17%. You know, its profitability is about 17%. It turns it back to the uh, to the treasury of North Dakota, and it goes into the general fund. That's the superficial argument. That's the, right. okay, so we would, we would have less interest. But now let's imagine that we have a public bank. 
Now, I need to go back and say a little bit more about the consequences of private banking creating all our money. And, and the, the reason is that um, it, creates a, it, it creates an awareness when we do this, when we look at the consequences. It creates an awareness of the extent to which the banking system has created the society, right? It creates the awareness that it doesn't have to be the way it is if we had a public bank. Right, that wasn't concerned about only issuing money for things that are profitable to it. So um, let's, uh, let's look at the consequence. If the um, money is issued by the bank as what it owes you when you, make, when you give it a promissory note and it puts what it owes you in your bank account, you are going to be paying principal and interest. They created only the principal. So okay. part of the question then is, well, if all the money comes into circulation as a debt to the bank or as the bank's liability, then every time you make a principal payment, right, the asset of the bank goes down, right? You're paying off that promissory note. Right. So the asset right. of the bank goes down and therefore also the amount of money goes down the liability of the bank goes down. Okay. Every principal payment extinguishes, every principal payment to the bank extinguishes the money. Okay. So by the time you've paid the entire principal, right, that money is gone again. It's disappeared into the accounting system by which it was created. <clears throat> okay. okay. Where is the interest that you're going to pay going to come from if all the money was created as the principal of a loan? Where does the interest come from if all of the money was created for the principal of the loan? Yeah. The interest is from you. You have to pay both the principal and the interest. So That's right. But, but, but from the mechanics of the monetary system, where does it come from? The Federal Reserve prints notes. They're oh. issued by... Uh, if all the money is being issued as a debt, right, as the principal of a loan, it has to come from new principal of loan. Okay. In order for you to pay the okay. interest, somebody else has to go into debt in order for you to okay. have the money to pay the interest. Okay. Not a problem. The interest circulates. The reason to, I'm not trying to say that there's a problem, right? But there is. Because what happens is that somebody is going to use that money to make another loan that doesn't extinguish, right? Who might use that money to make another loan, right? So the second biggest lender is the insurance companies. What are they gonna do with all that principal? All those uh, uh, premiums that they have, you know, cause when they make a payment, you make a little bit of a payment with your premium and they make great big payments, right? So they have to be able to cash out. Right? They have to invest that money. They have to invest that in very safe things. So they lend it. And if you're, okay. business, you're as likely to get a mortgage from an insurance company as from a bank. Okay. Malls, shopping malls, they're all insurance company money. So you have a huge, this is what, what Ellen calls the shadow banking system. In other words, the people who are lending the already borrowed money again, who are then lending the already borrowed money again. So each time you have interest. Now, the mechanics of the situation are such that if everybody paid off their bank loans, there would be no money. If okay. every, right? If everybody paid off their loan, right, there wouldn't be any money and you'd still owe all this interest. 
So that means that as a feature of the system, there has to be a debt that never gets paid down, no principal is ever paid, and it has to be big enough to be the permanent money supply. It never gets paid off. Can you okay. imagine what that debt would be? Really big. Really big. What's really, really big debt? Over $21 trillion. There you go. What is it? What, what is the $21 trillion? Dollars to, yeah, what is that debt? debt in the United States of America. There you go. It's the federal debt. When right. did it last get paid down? When did what? When did the la when was the last time that the federal debt got paid down? Uh, Clinton was president, I believe. And no, that was just no deficit, no increase. Okay. In the federal debt. That's what that was. Andrew Jackson. You got to go back to 1830, 1840, uh, right? <laughs> so the federal debt is the permanent money supply. Ah, uh, okay. You mean you mean the fact that the people owe all this money and it has no, I mean, if we had public banks, we could go into that sort of extreme debt with no consequence? You mean it's the nature of In money, theory. right? It's the nature of money. Right. That, that okay, so we're going to issue all the money as a, uh, as a loan, as a debt, as a, our liability, we'll use all of our income, all our tax income, all of our earnings for, for the state, and it'll be in the public bank. It's what capitalizes the public bank. We can follow all the same rules, but we can go into a similar amount of debt with no consequence? Theoretically, yes. It seems <laughs> okay. that way. So now you have an understanding of how everything, everything could change if we were to sit together and talk about how we want things to be. Let's say that um, it takes a while, we get a public bank, right? Okay. And so the city of San Francisco says, uh, what are we now able to do that we weren't able to do before? And the city council starts talking about it. And one of the things that comes up in conversation is, you know how you relieve poverty? You give people enough money so they're not poor. Hmm. What if you got a check every month at the beginning of the month Right, so that you were in a position to do what it is that you really wanted to do, what you love to do. Like UBI? Well, why do we need UBI? I, I, I don't want to veer off course on, on this another is not topic. Veering, no. This is not veering off course. The reason that you're talking to me, instead of to somebody who's talking about, well, then we'd pay less interest. And nothing would change except the public would pay less interest. We'd have a little bit more money so that we could build the public park. You've watched the little video, right? Where they get to they get a public bank so they get to build the park. Have you seen I, I that? Understand on the the, it's on the it's on the public banking website. Okay. But you're talking to me so that you get a real appreciation for the power of the public bank. So okay. If we're sitting together and we can issue money, we can go into infinite debt with no consequence. I mean, we can go from, you know, six or eight trillion dollars to twenty-one trillion dollars in ten years, or twenty-two or twenty-three. We don't even know how much it is, right? Or go look at the debt clock and watch it. Look at how much it is per person. I mean, do you know about the debt clock? Yes. Okay, <laughs> so you can go and click on your state, your town, I mean, your city, what have you, how much in taxes, how much debt per person, et cetera, et cetera. I have it on my phone so I can show it to people every once in a while. Anyway, 
So the question arises, how do we relieve poverty? Um, if you give people enough money to live, they're not poor anymore. And they're not being forced to do something that they don't want to do. Okay, so let's go back to, this is why you're interviewing me, so that you get the picture of how powerful public banking could really be. It's okay. really important. So let's go back to the Declaration of Independence for a moment. And I won't give you much history, I'll just give you a wee little bit, okay? And let's think about what it says. Governments are instituted among men to secure their inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if we want to secure our life, we would need to give everybody enough money to live at the level that the economy can support. Right? If we want to secure their life, if everybody has a right to life, right, then we need to make sure that they have enough money to live. That's what this whole thing about, you know, free health care and, and uh, social security and uh, all this stuff is all about. It's where we keep going, right? That's why Andrew Yang's running on, you know, guaranteed income, because it's just so simple. If we don't want poor people, we got to give them money. Okay, here's the problem. That makes no sense. Nobody would do anything. Oh, you mean the existing system has so distorted human nature that we forget that everybody's just like us? And the only thing that makes you happy is the liberty to do what you love to do? To pursue the transcendent purpose that motivates you? to pursue the life mission that you experience ongoing? Are you living out of your life's mission, out of your purpose, out of your life's purpose? Are you oriented all the time? You, Marcus, are you oriented towards doing what you believe in would be good for society? Yes. Are you like everybody else? Uh, that's a very big question. Uh, okay, so you're arrogant motivated. enough to believe that you're way better than most people. No. No. Okay, so if I am at liberty to pursue my mission in life, if I am at liberty to pursue my life's purpose, right, then I will pursue happiness. What is the only thing that genuinely makes you happy? Succeeding in your life's mission and doing it your way. Sure. With the opportunity to develop your capacity to do it increasingly well in cooperation with all the people who you feel are part of your community. Okay. You mean if we had public banks? we could free everybody up to do the meaningful thing that they feel called to do with the capacity, with the possibility of ongoing uh, quality improvement, right? Oh my God. We could totally change society. Why would we ever permit the externalization of costs? Why do we permit garbage and pollution? There's absolutely no need. Let's clean it all up. We're not. Okay, the question is, is it a good idea? Right? Are there people <clears throat> who really want to do it for whom it's mission? Right? Yeah. Are they capable of doing it? Yeah, they've uh, got the training. They've got the... Okay. Um, is it a good use of the built and natural resources? Okay, so yep. it's a good idea. We think it's a good idea. We like it. it. It would benefit everybody. It's a good idea. There are people who really want to do it and they're capable of doing it and it's a good use of the resources. Okay. When you have a public bank, the question is no longer where are you going to get the money? 
It doesn't have it's to be funded. profitable. We're going to issue the money for it. Why? Because it's a good idea. There are people who want to do it and they're capable of doing it and it's a good use of the resources. Okay. Boom. As opposed to a private bank where it's wanting only to make if a profit. it's profitable for the bank. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have to be profitable. Okay. Now, will the money circulate? Okay, now here comes the crux of the thing. We're coming up on eight minutes to the hour. So that if we want to finish it in an hour, we're going to do yeah. the last piece. Here's yeah. something that everybody knows. And the reason that I take my hard earned money and exchange it for something that I want is because I will be better off in my estimation, in my sense of, of value. I will be better off than if I hold on to the money. I'm going to buy that car because that car will make me better off than if I just hold on to my old car and keep the money and not spend it or borrow it or what have you. Every transaction that is entered into by two parties freely with no hidden, you know, transparent, no fraud, right, makes both parties to the exchange better off. You got that? Yeah. I go into the store and I know that if I buy whatever it is at the advertised price, the store is going to be better off. <clears throat> In fact, that's why they're there. Right? And I'm going to be better off. They'd rather have the money. I'd rather have the toaster or the car or whatever or the food or the what have you. And I'm willing to pay a little more for organic because I think it's better for me and the environment. Okay. So human nature is such that every transaction freely entered into, facilitated by money, makes both parties to the transaction better off. Sure. This is the capital formation process. <clears throat> In the aggregate, with all the transactions that are happening, we should all be increasingly better off. Where is the surplus going to? Where is the better off going to? How does the system work? Did you buy the bank a house first? Where yeah, is the better yeah, off yeah, going the to? The banking system. Yeah, yes. It's going to interest. Right. <laughs> okay, so okay. let's imagine for a moment that the bank charges enough interest to cover its costs and that's it. Okay. And it only makes equity investments. Okay. It only ever issues money as an equity investment or to fund something that isn't, ever, you know, that's not going to be profitable, that will be subsidized out of the uh, profits from the equity investments. Now, now everything that happens is related to the fortunes of the business. It was a good idea. They were competent. Okay, it's going to keep going, making more money, more value, creating more value. We're going to have to issue more money to represent that value. We were wrong. They weren't capable. That whole millions of dollars that we plowed into that project, it didn't work. Okay, we have to take money out of circulation. Right? In other words, we have to keep the money value constant. Right. Why, why does the banking system inflate the money? Because you're paying with current value money up front in interest. So it's fine if you pay off the loan with inflated money at the end. Okay. From a banking point of view, that makes per okay, so let's target two or three percent inflation. That'll keep us healthy us bankers <laughs> okay so last piece of this the banking system by being private and only issuing money for things that it thinks will be profitable to it that it's sure will be profitable to the bank right is creating the situation that we're in 
because the interest is due and payable regardless of what happens in your life or in what it is that you put the money up for. Yeah. You have to pay the interest regardless. So is everybody pursuing their transcendent purpose? Or is everybody making sure they have enough money to make the mortgage payment? Uh, that's, a, that's a very deep philosophical that's existential question. That's what I market. said, yes. But it's what public banking makes possible. Public banking, we can say to each other, no, we should all be doing that which we feel called to do. And we don't have to look at it from a religious point of view because everybody has that experience of what should I dedicate my life to? What should I do with my life? Well, okay, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get a good job and I can support my family. No, 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 no. Whatever I do, we're getting a check at the beginning of the month. A dividend, not a, not a debt base. You know, it's just a dividend off the overall productivity of the economy. If you want to learn about that as a system, you go to social credit uh, on the internet, the Michael Journal, whatever, Wikipedia. There was a whole movement at the time of the Federal Reserve with the establishment of the Federal Reserve for the dividend that results from everybody's increasingly better off. Well, we need to issue the money and distribute it to everybody so that they have the money in order to buy all the goods and services that the economy is capable of producing. Right. So Circular there's a social fund. dividend. We need to be able to issue the money. Okay, so you get the check at the beginning of the month. You are now in a position to do, you are now at liberty to do what makes you happy. And the thing that makes you happy is succeeding in your mission in life. And you can test this with your group. Whenever you're sitting in a circle, say, hey, let's take five or 10 minutes and let's talk about what we're most afraid of. So after they get past the, I won't be able, I'll lose my job and I won't be able to make the mortgage payments. It turns out that the thing that everybody is most afraid of, everybody is most afraid of, is not succeeding in accomplishing their life's work, their mission in life. So let us put everyone in a position to cooperate with each other, to create what it is that they want to dedicate their blood, sweat, and tears to. That is what public banking makes possible. Why? Because the question is, is it a good idea? Are there people who want to do it? Are they capable of doing it? Is it a good use of the resources? Because if it is, we're going to issue the money for it. In fact, the reason we can issue the money, money is that that's a promise to make it valuable, to do the thing that we all agreed would be valuable, would benefit everyone, would be wonderful. And now you are no longer in a position to think we're going to save some interest. Hmm. No, the people will be deciding. The city council will be deciding what would be good for everyone. And if the federal debt can go from $12 trillion before the whatchamacallit, the bankers blew up the housing market and crashed it, right? And made a huge profit and consolidated all the, all the banks. You know, we went from 40% to 20% independent banks, approximately, right? To t over 20, to $22 trillion, and there hasn't been inflation and interest rates are really, why are interest rates so low? Because, right. at, their, because at their traditional uh, rate, we would never be able to pay the interest on the federal debt. It would take up more than all of the tax revenue. So they better keep interest rates down low really low oh and it has another consequence you there's no safe place to invest your money <laughs> now everybody oh. has to invest their money now uh, 
Did you hear that or is the internet unstable? Uh, no, that's uh, an alarm. I got to go in about five minutes, but I did no, have about fine. two minutes worth of comments I'd like to make before we before go we right ahead. Okay, so this has been a discussion on public banking. What we're referring to is known as Assembly Bill 857. It was passed here in California in October 2019, but originally it was based upon an attempt in 2014 by Ellen Brown and others to pass. The interesting thing was that in 2014, both houses or the complete Sacramento legislature approved of this, but Governor Brown shut it down. Governor Newsom, with little fanfare and little acknowledgement, has basically made this law. It's enabling legislation, and as John Root has said, it doesn't actually make any of the banks here, but it allows us to legally make them happen. This has been a debate for five years, and the fact that it's uh, quickly and with little notice happened is significant. The big difference about a public bank versus a private bank is that Governments will now, instead of paying a private bank interest money, like Wells Fargo, will deposit your tax dollars or any revenues that the city, county, state, uh, or other uh, government agencies will go into the private bank. So the then public that bank, bank. I'm sorry? We'll go into the public bank. We'll go into the public bank, yes. Where we'll they, go into the public bank. Where the interest benefits the public. Yes, where the interest benefits the public. So you have your governments, and right now you as a taxpayer pay taxes to the government. And then the government pays some of your taxes to a bank to house your taxes. Instead of doing that, the government would put this money into the public bank and it wouldn't have to raise interest rates on itself, which means that the government is actually saving money by depositing its tax revenue in the public bank. That money can be used to give loans back to cities, et cetera, for infrastructure projects at low or no interest. So you have two savings. One is that the California government would be able to fund infrastructure projects without paying for interest or very low interest. Additionally, the California government would no longer be paying millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to private banks to service or hold the tax money in return. So you have tax savings and you have low interest loans. To collect, to co collectively, that allows California to invest in a lot of things. Just a couple quick numbers. When we look at the North Dakota Bank, and it was the public bank, and we look at 2010 numbers, they had $4 billion in assets and $327 million in capital cash available for loaning. Now, I did a quick <laughs> survey of the North Dakota economy in 2016 and compared it to California. Basically, California is 49 times larger than North Dakota. So if we look at 2016 numbers, and this is if you had a California public bank or a series of public banks and their combined um, assets and liquid cash. So looking at the North Dakota numbers, California's public bank or series of banks comprising a California public banking system would equal uh, $16 billion in liquid cash available for loans and $196 billion in assets. What's key for Californians is to recognize that the highly controversial gas tax here in California, which half the population didn't like, was only going to raise $52 billion over a 10-year period. The public bank alone has $16 billion per annum with no increase in tax revenue and actually a savings. Whereas we in California had to raise gas taxes on ourselves to make $52 billion. But frankly put, we <laughs> wouldn't need the gas tax and we'd have money left over and we could fix all our roads and we'd have tax savings <laughs> if we had a public bank. Additionally, one last thing I gotta point out though is that public banks are recession proof. While every bank in America was going down during the global recession of 2008, the North Dakota Public Bank consistently showed earnings every year throughout the recession when all of the private banks didn't. If we have a public bank and we have the surplus budget that Governor Brown started and being continued under the current governor, we will have two effective tools for the next recession, which everyone says is coming. <laughs> Given that California was the worst hit state in all of America in the 2008 recession, basically we were hit the worst, it's in our interest as Californians 
to not go into a super horrible dip in the next recession. A public bank and our surplus would allow us to do that. I'm done. Right, and what I was trying to do in this interview was expand our under, or ex expand our understanding of what public banking. Oh yeah, do, yeah. So that the we deep would philosophy. Get, so that we would get to that place where we understand that the primary tool that the sovereign uses to create the conditions in which we all live is money creation, and if private banks are creating it then society reflects their need for profit. And if public banks are doing it, then we get what we decide together would be good. In so other words, if the, people, if the people are gonna be sovereign, then the question is, what do the people want? What would benefit everyone? Well, if the money is being issued by the people, in order to accomplish what the people have committed to doing, no different from borrowing the money from the bank, right? You're committed to doing what it is that you said you wanted to do, right? But it doesn't have right. to be profitable. Right. right. Right? It has to be good. Right. And everything changes. If right. the people are issuing the money, then society reflects our values, not profit. Right. And so, we, could, we could prioritize environmental healing. We could prioritize no poverty. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they've been doing an experiment with UBI in Stockton yeah. recently to see if it even worked out. And uh, I think the money's coming from a private company, but it could come from a public bank. In theory, there's nothing stopping that, as I understand. Yeah. Okay, very good. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the philosophy. I Go think ahead. the thing is that we are so used to, it's about making profit and everybody looks out for the bottom line and increasing profit to, that you hear that there would be a, financial system that fundamentally doesn't use that as the decision process for making decisions and that it looks at i don't know if it's profitable is it a good thing to do for the public it's just americans don't entertain that thought process when make when dealing with cash and so i think it's a very new and and, and exotic to think about finances that way and i think you did a great job at pushing a human mind through what they've known and grown up with into a basically theoretical possibilities that we've never actually seen before. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it much. And thank yeah. you to Jim. Thank Jim you, Hogue. Jim. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Second Vermont Republic uh, connection. From another interview I did with Jim Hogue, Second Vermont Republic, he referred me to John Root Jr., who's an expert on public banking and was able to walk you through, not just the mechanics, but what does this mean how society in California could change at the individual level simply by having to think, because now there's the possibility of a bank that isn't just trying to make a profit over people's bodies. And, and how radically that could change our entire society here. You, okay. You've heard it. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah, is, is absolutely. Recognize this isn't just mon dollars and cents. Like, this could change the way a society thinks. Absolutely. That's impressive. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, please I send will. me a recording on Google Drive or wherever, and I will post this up. Okay. Today. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, sir. Bye, Marcus. You and I both have to get to our next engagement. <laughs> See thank you, John. Okay. Thank you. Bye.